in the circular world, experience often suggests growth and it is measured by the skills acquired over time. Experience is the content or substance of what has been learned or added to the individual during the course of working on a job or engaging in some activity. And in saying just the number of years one has been working or engaged in an activity is not enough to adequately gauge a person's experience. And to bear this out, people want to know the specifics of what the individual has done or has been evolving during the period of the job in addition to the number of years or months the person has spent on the job. Similarly, saying one has been a Christian for a certain number of years is not enough to determine the level of one's spiritual or Christian maturity and spiritual growth. Rather equally as important is the effort the believer has invested in the means God has provided for the spiritual growth of his children. It needs to be understood longevity is not the same as growth. Unfortunately, not every believer makes effort to grow. Hence, you often find believers of several years in the faith who are still like babies in the faith in behavior and attitude. No, these believers consider themselves to be elders or mature Christians because they became Christians long ago and have been with the Bible, or should I say they've carried the Bible all along and have been attending church and other Christian activities. They have not grown beyond the basics of the Christian faith. They have not grown spiritually because they have not made the personal efforts required on their part for their spiritual growth. They fail to realize that longevity differs from growth and they had assumed they had grown just because they had been in the church for a long time. The truth is, growth, come, growth comes from personal application of the means of growth and not from long association. A person may carry the Holy Bible for years without studying it and thus remain ignorant of basic biblical principles. This is quite common in our day with the electronic Bible all over the place. Yes, you find it on the computers, on the smartphones, tablets, and other means of communication and work today. But then this has not improved the literacy of believers. Yes, unfortunately, Bible illiteracy is prevalent within the church. Yes, that might surprise you, but if you look around, you won't be surprised. This is an ever-present problem of the church. Too many believers are Bible illiterate. It's not that they don't have the Bible. It's not that they don't uh, uh, attend events. The thing is, they lack basic knowledge and understanding of the Word of God. And this is because... They do not study the scriptures for themselves. They hear things, they don't care to check them, and they follow people with uncritical mind. They don't assess, they don't analyze, they don't reflect on what they hear. There is this unfortunate attitude that just calling yourself a Christian makes them knowledgeable. Again, this is disobedience of a direct command of God. For he commands his people to study his word and that his word should govern their faith and practice always. Yes, Bible illiteracy results 
in numerous problems, both for the individuals and also for the congregation of the church and even the people they have to associate with. Being illiterate of the word of God leads to errors in practice of the faith. Yes, that's a major problem. Such professing to be Christians who are illiterate of, illiterate of scripture become gullible and vulnerable to false teachers and false prophets and others who are out for their own personal gain. Since they are unlearned in the things of God. Yes, many of them develop sectarian and party spirits within congregations and cause divisions and strife within the body of Christ. Many are unstable and fall to fall for every wave of doctrine frequently moving from one movement or group to another as they are swayed by whatever they hear. Yes, they are not grounded in the word. And since they are not grounded in the word, everything they hear seems okay. As long as few words here, like Jesus, like salvation, you know, are thrown in with a lot of other false, you know, a lot of falsehood. They take it that well, that must be a Christian organization. To such, every church and movement are the same. They are all serving Jesus Christ. They do nice things. You know, they are nice people. They mention the name of Jesus. They do this, they do that. And so we see this error in the life of many. Often, the primary reason for this sorry state of many believers is the neglect of the means God has provided for his people to grow. The means God has provided for his people to get to know him, to get to know the rules and practice of their faith. Many are not, yes, many are not only physically lazy, but they are mentally lazy too. To worsen the situation, when they are pointed to things that can be helpful for their growth and encouraged to put more effort into developing themselves spiritually, they feel frequently insulted and unappreciated. Many will tell you that, oh, is it because you are this or you are that? Look, I have been a Christian longer than you. All in an attempt to shut you up. Remember this, God commands obedience of his word. Many people today are looking for or they are seeking what they call the mind of God. They know they want, they claim they want to know the will of God. We need to realize that the Lord commands his disciples to obey his commands and to grow spiritually. So where do you find those things? You find those things in holy scripture that is where you find the mind of god and to find that you require time again god commands effort on the part of the believers to live a life that honors and glorifies god and that is a blessing to human beings it is essential we call the attention of believers to this unpleasant situation and to encourage one another and to have to see and apply the means for their growth that God has provided. Therefore, the title of this <clears throat> video is God Mandates Abundance of These Traits in Believers. You see that beautiful colored bird there. That's not a painting. That's a picture of God's creation. When believers live in harmony, the traits of God are beautifully illustrated in their lives as we see the artistic prowess of God upon that beautiful bird. And so it is important for us to recognize this. This is not man's word. 
God actually mandates abundance of these traits in believers. So we want to encourage all believers in Christ to put more effort into the use of the means God has provided for their spiritual growth so they may please the Lord. And so the text of Holy Scripture to guide us is as in the Epistle of Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5, 5 to 8. And I read, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall never neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless his words in our hearts in Jesus' name. The background of prelude to this passage is that God has given believers in Christ the divine power and promise. Yes, believers are given divine power and promise which made it possible for them to participate or to partake in divine nature and the exceeding promises made by God. Believers' participation in divine nature enables them to overcome the corruption caused by evil desires. Yes, since believers have been given all what they need, for life and godliness, according to Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 4, they are then challenged to increase in and manifest the character traits of the divine nature. And so we have Second Peter chapter 1, verses 5 to 11. Yes, those, that's where the challenges are listed. And our text is from this section of the chapter. Yes, you, you get that right. Believers are challenged to increase in the character traits of the divine nature. When they increase, then they will manifest this in their daily living. And people will then see. And so coming back to the word of God that we just read, the verse 5 says, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, and to virtue, knowledge. So it is saying, oh, for this very reason. For what reason? For the very reason of the blessings given by God, in first in, in uh, the second Peter chapter one verses three to four, the believers must be totally dedicated to the Lord. Remember again, they have been given a power to partake of divine nature. And so it's important that believers demonstrate their total dedication to the law by giving all diligence. That is, by making maximum effort. Yes, to grow and become Christ-like. All diligence, or every effort that the believer is able to master. Yes, remember, the believer is still expected to make personal efforts, to live a life that honors and glorifies God. This is abundantly clear from the pages of Holy Scripture. Our Lord himself commanded, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. 
Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Though God has given his divine power to the to, <coughs> to the each one is to strive to enter in at the street gate. For many, I say unto you, we seek to enter in and shall not be able. Luke 13, 24. Ephesians tells us this, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and have done all to stand. That's Ephesians 6, 13. Again, remember, it is God which works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians 2.13 All these point to that truth that even though God has given the believer the power, all the power for godly living, all the power for life that pleases God, the believer is not to think God has done everything for him. So I can just relax and enjoy the right to heaven without any effort. No. Any believer thinking like that is in error. Rather, the true believer in Christ will from a heart of gratitude and love for Christ desire to and take or, or make the sincere effort to be Christ-like. Yes, that is what is expected of the genuine believer. So, so believers must grow in their faith by diligently cultivating the qualities listed in 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 5 to 7. And so we are told here, giving all diligence, again, that's making maximum effort to grow and become Christ-like. So we're then given where this diligence is supposed to be add to your <clears throat> Excuse me. Add to your faith. Add there is supply in abundance and lavishly, not sparingly, not a little, not a few. Rather, the believers are to give everything that is needed. Add to your faith. Faith here is faith in God and in Christ. This faith, in addition to obtaining salvation, results in the transformation of the life of the recipient of salvation. Yes, this faith marks the beginning of the new life. You know, anybody in Christ is a new creature. All things are passed away, all are become new. This is the beginning of a fruitful, lifelong relationship with God that culminates in eternity in the presence of God. This faith marks the beginning of the new life in which the believer now walks with Christ as a Christian, a genuine child of God who is born again by the Spirit. This is a faith. It is not the end but the beginning of the new spiritual reality in the life of the new creature in Christ. And so it's, it's important for us to understand this. The Bible tells us, And you had it quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2, 1. Virtue. You add to your faith. The first thing mentioned is virtue. Or moral excellence. Or courage. Manliness. The quality of life that makes the believer stand out as excellent. A moral power or energy that performs deeds that are excellent. So the believer is to add that to his or her faith. And to virtue, that is to moral excellence, knowledge. Knowledge, that is understanding. It is knowing God with familiarity gained through experience from association with Christ. This is not talking of secular knowledge or the knowledge of the world. This is talking of the knowledge of God, the knowledge of Christ. 
the knowledge of what God is, who God is, what God does, how he works. Uh -huh. This is what people often say, oh, I want to know the mind of God. I want to know the will of God. I want to know what God has for me. It is this knowledge, yes, of knowing God that is being spoken of here. It is the truth of God properly understood and appropriately applied. This knowledge implies diligent study of the word of God, prayerfully studying and being submitted to the Holy Spirit and the pursuit of the truth of God in daily With this quality, the courage and zeal of the believer will be formed and intelligent. Yes, this is not just intellectual knowledge, but the spiritual knowledge from the Holy Spirit as the believers focus on both the person and the word of God. Again, it is important for us to understand God expects us to have the zeal that is informed by his word. We are not to have zeal without knowledge. Unfortunately, there are many believers or there are many who are professing to be Christians who have zeal, but they lack knowledge. And when you lack knowledge of the truth, you're only serving yourself. You're actually not serving God. And you may actually be making the work of other believers more difficult. So we are informed or commanded, but go, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Second Peter 3.18 So it's not just any knowledge, it is the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The more we know of Christ, the more we know of God, the more we know how the Holy Spirit works, the easier it will be for us to work with God. The easier it will be for us to increase in our faith. The more difficult it will be for us to just be fearful of almost everything. The, the greater the word in us, the higher or the stronger our faith and the less our fear. And to knowledge, temperance. Yes, temperance is self-control. Temperance is moderation in action, thought or feeling. It is a term applied to athletes preparing to compete for honors in games. Such preparation often involves a long period of training that included a lot of self-control and self-denial. Yes, because the athlete focuses on winning the crown. And so he restrains himself from unnecessary indulgence, including food, drinks, and leisure that can hinder him from winning the race. So he, 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 he purposefully, deliberately controls his appetites, his desires, with that winning the crown being his focus and so he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city proverbs 1632 the athlete puts his body under subjection that's the word that is used there and so the believer in christ is to have self-control bringing his desires appetites and cravings of his flesh under control and in conformity with the commandments of God. Yes, it's very important for us to understand this. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ used a dramatic description for this level of self-control. And if thy right high offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that the whole body be cast into hell. 
God is not, I mean, the, the Lord is not suggesting a bodily mutilation there. That's a figure of speech, letting us know that we should be ready to take whatever drastic action is necessary for us to bring our appetites under control. We're not just to be, uh, 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 we're not just to fulfill or attend to every craving of our body. That's what the Lord is saying. And the apostle gives his own experience. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. 1 Corinthians 9, 27. He bridles his appetite. He doesn't just eat anything just because the body wants it. He doesn't sleep for as long as his body wants. He, he, he doesn't use his mouth anyhow. He recognizes and focuses on Jesus Christ. This is what is expected of us believers. Meekness, temperance against such there is no law. Galatians 5.23 As believers face mockers, false teachers, and others who deride their faith and practice, they are to remain steadfast in their faith in the face of adversity, refusing to give in to the demands of the ungodly or giving up their faith. So this is very, very important. Self-control. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope. Romans 5, 3 to 4. And so it is again very, very important for us to know all this, that this is what we're being told. Believers are commanded, as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now, yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. We are not to accede to anything or just anything our body wants. That's Romans 6, 19. Mortify therefore your members, which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. We see there some of these things that our body may crave, that our environment may throw at us. We see them specifically mentioned. There are so many, there are many lists similar to this on the pages of Holy Scripture, as if God is trying to let us know specifically, we are not to deny the knowledge of the Word of God. We are not to pretend we don't know what the Word of God is saying when it, the Word of God is talking about self-control, when the Word of God is talking about knowledge of Christ, when the Word of God is talking about godliness and other things that we are as believers who have. And so, believers are to so discipline their desires that their desires are servants to them and they are not the, are not the masters. Yes, the power of the Lord Jesus Christ enables the believers to overcome sin in their own lives since the Lord has broken the power of sin over the believer. And temperance, and so temperance, Patience. Patience here is the capacity or habit of being patient. This is patient endurance or perseverance. It is endurance and faithfulness to God to the end. This is not the resignation to a situation in a helpless and hopeless attitude. No. Rather, it's a vibrant living hope of assurance and the power love, compassion, and faithfulness of the Lord. It is the perseverance that is acutely aware that the Lord remains in sovereign control. As we are told, it is of the Lord that we are not consumed. His faith is compassionate and His faithfulness are new every 
money. Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. Believers in Christ face oppositions every day. They must make the choice to continue to serve the Lord faithfully and continually, even as a society attempts to force them into its mold. We are not to synchronize our faith with the desires and the dictates of the environment around us. Yes, believers must persevere in their resistance to the allures of the world around them and continue to conform to God rather than to the world. And that's what is speaking of here of patient endurance. And to patience, add godliness. Yes, godliness. This is piety or devotion to God in the acts of daily living by believers. It is growing in divine likeness. There are those who will have a form of godliness but deny the power of God. Believers are to turn away from such and not emulate their ungodly behavior. 2 Timothy 3.5 And so it is very, very important for us. Godliness is God-likeness. Attributes, traits that are ascribable to God. Yes, believers are to add this to their faith. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. Brotherly kindness, that is, an active goodwill toward others. Galatians 6, 10. The kindness that shows forth in mutual affection, help, and sacrifice for one another. Again, we are giving several examples. Be ye, bear ye one another's burden, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6, 2. But whoso had this world's good, and seeth his brother half a need, and shut it up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him. 1 John 3, 17. In other words, you have material things that your fellow believers need, but you refuse to give, you refuse to show compassion then how can you claim that the love of God lives in you? That's the, of course, uh, the answer is no, the love of God doesn't live in you if you have the means to alleviate the material need of your fellow believer and you refuse to do it. You are actually living in disobedience. You are, li you are, you are like a hypocrite, the love you claim to have for God. The love of God you you claim to have in your heart we have been told here it is not there because if it is there it will manifest in your outward activity your outward behavior let brotherly love continue Hebrews 13 1 remember again brotherly kindness is a mark of the genuine disciple of Jesus Christ Yes, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Galatians 6 10. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. John 13 35. That's the Lord speaking. For whoso had this was good and seeth his brother half need. Again, we read that before. Uh, if you have the means to alleviate the material need of your fellow Christian and you refuse, then you are showing by your action that you don't have the love of God in your heart. And so, through brotherly kindness, charity, Yes, that is love. Charity is love. This love 
is the believer's craving the highest good of and for others, as God demonstrates towards sinners. We are told that while we were yet sinners, God demonstrated his love for us by sacrificing Jesus Christ. He did not wait for us to clean up ourselves. While we were still sinners, God did this. And so also, we are to think of the highest good of others. We are not to think the worst of them. We are not to wait until they grow there before us. Whatever good we can do to them, we should voluntarily do. So it is very, very important for us to understand that. As God, again, remember, we have been given divine, uh, the ability to partake in divine nature. We're now being told of the traits of that divine nature that should be in us as believers. Again, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For if these things, you see the word there, if is small, but the implication is big. It is letting us know that these things may not be in some people. If these things, the virtues listed, that is, that we have mentioned, in 1 Peter verses, I mean, verse Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 to 7, be, ye, be in you and abound. If the believers have these virtues, these traits of divine nature, and they are increasing in the believers, the impact will be great. They make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful. In other words, such believers will not be unproductive or useless. To be unproductive or useless is to be lacking in spiritual growth and thus be ineffective. In what is all this? In the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. All these are for the purpose of knowing the Lord Jesus Christ intimately. Again, it is all about Christ. He has died for all, all believers. And we ought to dedicate our lives to him. And so the question arises, how do we increase in the trace of divine nature? And so how to increase in the trace of divine nature? First, we need to understand and be willing to obey the command. Yes, believers in Christ are commanded and encouraged to increase in and manifest the character traits of the divine nature of which they have been called to be partakers. So, believers need to believe. They need to know that this is what God has said. He said he has given the believer the power. This is not mere talk. For God not only names these traits, but has provided the means to attain what he wants. We have seen a few of these traits of the divine nature in our text. I hope you still remember to your faith, you are to add virtue. That is moral excellence. You are to add knowledge. You are to add temperance. Yes. So, perhaps you are still wondering how to move forward according to the scripture. Here are some truths according to Holy Scripture. Again, God has given all the believer needs for life and godly living. The divine power of God has given believers, right, all things that pertain unto life and godly. 
through the knowledge of him who has called believers by his own glory and excellence. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 3. According as his divine power had given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory, virtue. Verse 4 continues, by which he has given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises, so that through this you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. From Peter chapter 1 verse 4, the divine power of the Lord Jesus Christ are given everything believers need for life and godly living. And therefore both fruitful life and godly living are attainable through the believer's knowledge of him that is Christ. That's what we just read now. We are informed. For unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1 4. So are you looking for power? Are you looking for the wisdom of God? Then have intimate knowledge. First, have a new relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. By being born again by the Spirit. Then devote your effort, yes, to know Him intimately. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, by diligent study of the Word, reflecting on what you are studying, and putting into practice prayerfully what you are learning. If you are looking for the will of God, if you want to know or you want to have the power to do, the difficult things God command. We're just being told here in this passage that Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. In other words, if you belong to Christ, in as has been told, we have been told before, if you are in Christ, you have the power of God. You have the wisdom of God. Hence, the more intimate knowledge of Christ believers have, the more useful and fruitful they will be as they draw from Christ. As we are told again, and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. To the word there again, knowledge. That is complete knowledge of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 9. For this cause we also, since the day we had it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will. You see that? The knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That is, he there, his there is the will of God, the will of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord. And you see there, walking worthy. Of the Lord, not walking worthy of some church or, or, or some organization of to the dictator of some other people. It is walking worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And you see, there everything is about Christ, everything is about God. Our whole life. Colossians 1, 9 to 10. Understand again, obedience is an obligation mandated by salvation. In other words, if you are genuinely saved, you are under obligation to obey Jesus Christ. You need to understand that. Remember, all believers have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, the believers still live, yet not the believer or Christ living through him. In other words, you watching this video, if you belong to Christ, it means you have been crucified with Christ, but you are living. 
And because you are living, the life you are living now is no more your life. Rather, it is Christ living his life through you. And so, can you see any virtue, any evidence or trait of divine nature in your behavior? So, therefore, the life the believer now lives in the flesh, he lives by the faith of the Son of God, who loved him and gave himself for the believer. That's Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. So, salvation obligates the genuine believer to conform to a life of righteousness. The life of the believer must conform to the life of Christ, were he to be the one physically walking and walking where the believer is now. Again, understand this. Fruit bearing is a mandatory responsibility of believers. The believers in Christ have been given exceeding great and precious promises. By such promises, they may partake of divine nature. They have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. In 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4, having all the above is no reason to sit back and relax as if everything has been done for them. Rather, there is work for the believers to do. They must grow and become fruitful. A fruit-bearing tree grows from being a young shoot to a mature tree and then begins to produce fruit. Similarly, the believers in Christ are commanded and are expected to grow spiritually and then begin to bear fruit. So in view of what the Lord has done for believers in Christ, the believers have a responsibility to be diligent. To be diligent in what? Believers already have faith, otherwise they will not be Christian or disciples of Christ. All the nutrients the believers need for their spiritual growth have been provided but they have the responsibility of appealing themselves of the appropriate reason. Many believers are wrong in their thinking. Yes, many think of growth only in terms of evangelism and influx of new believers into the church. They thus neglect the most important and crucial issue of the spiritual growth and progress towards Christ-likeness, the believers. Many forget that the first that God wants is your person before your action and activities. If your heart is not given to the Lord, if the virtue that demonstrates your relationship with God is not showing forth, whatever you are doing, amounts to vapor or nothing else before God. You must first be given. This is what many do not understand. Why much effort is directed at evangel evangelism? Mark you, evangelism is important and is, is commanded. But why much effort is directed at evangelism? Believers are not properly fed and nurtured. Yes, those who have come into the church are neglected. And so you find somebody who has been a professed believer for 5-10 years, who is not nurtured. Yes, who is not growing. Yes, of course, many times the problem is both ways. Uh -huh. The believer who jumps from one church to another, or from one movement to another, from one group to another, never staying in one place, you know, we never grow. You see, if you plant something, after two days you uproot it and go and plant it somewhere, 
after another two days you go and plant you keep like that that thing will eventually wither then die many believers are like that they are looking for specific things you hear things like oh that pastor has no power that other one has no anointing oh, over there this is what they do over so they move from place to place they are never learning anything they are trying to milk others for what god says they should make effort to acquire themselves so they are always looking to others and since they are never satisfied they never stay in one place and so they never grow there are many also who think that the holy spirit will do everything for them they think oh they have they are now believers in christ you know christ has paid all they are only just to sit down relax and then take a jolly ride to heaven it's a break a, a, a great mistake many people make some others look up to other believers to do all things for them there are people who cannot pray by themselves. They must go to the pastor. They must call upon somebody. You see, it's good to pray together groups, but the onus is first on the person to, deflect, to develop he or herself. While others can help you with your problems, they will neither be able to grow spiritually for you or make you grow spiritually. If you don't make the effort, you see, you, you are feeding, for example, you have a child. For that child to grow, that child needs nutrition. Now you feed the child with adequate nutrition. You don't eat the food and say the child will grow. No, you give the child the food and then the child will grow. That is what God has done for us. God has given us the means to grow. It is for us now to take the means and apply to ourselves. Unfortunately, there are even people who contract others to pray for them or to fast for them or those who claim, look, you don't need to do it yourself. I just pray for you. This is how much you must pay. So I can fast for you. They continue, and then you continue in ignorance. You continue, you know, as a baby Christian, you continue to be gullible and to be vulnerable. To those who are merchandising the word of God. So you need to wake up. You need to grow spiritually. Yes. So it's very, very, very important. The same is true for the believer. Hmm? Each believer must personally use the means for spiritual growth the Lord has provided for him to grow. Yes, God is not partial. Yes, God is not partial at all. I'm aware you some claim, oh, this one is more anointed, this one is least. Look, bend down, obey the word of God. You will see the difference in your own life. If the believer does not diligently make the effort himself, he will remain a baby Christian. And so we find that many believers have stunted spiritual growth. Yes, they are not thinking that believers have nothing to do because God has provided everything has led to inaction or wrong action by many believers. Some of these have already been mentioned. Since they are unlearned in the things of God, many of them develop sectarian and party spirits within congregations and cause division and strife within the body of Christ. Yes, many are unstable. Yes, and fall for every wave of doctrine. And they frequently move from church to church, from movement to movement. All they need to hear is a few lies, I mean, a few words of scripture, like salvation, oh Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, mixed with a lot of lies they will believe in fact many of them will tell you look all these churches are the same you know the people are nice i know they're manifesting the love of christ you see it's not about doctrine you know we, it's about the things that unite us you no know, god is nice oh you know? god is love 
uh, God, you know, wants everybody to believe, and they begin to rationalize. When you point them to scripture, they know and they have clever ways of arguing their way out. And so you need to be aware of this. They are, as the Bible puts it, they are like the reed that is swayed by the wind. They fall for every wave of doctrine. They are as unstable as water. Yes, because they are not rooted in of the word of God. And in reality, many times, all they are looking for is how to fulfill their lust. So it is very important for us to recognize this. Truly, there are many believers who have professed faith in Christ, but have not grown spiritually. They remain babies in Christ. He as we to as unto babes in Christ, and you cannot speak to such as adults, but they have to be spoken to as to babes. The problem is that when you speak to them like that, they feel insulted. Yes. These are the ones they have refused to grow and they have become stunted in their growth. As we are told in Hebrews 5, 12 to 14, with the time they were supposed to be teachers, <clears throat> they were having to be taught. And what are they having to be taught? Basic things they should have mastered. You know, so it is very important for us to recognize that. When they should be teachers, they are having to be taught the first principles. And like those who still need milk and not strong meat, are unskilled in the word of righteousness. Hebrews 5, <coughs> excuse me, Hebrews 5, 12 to 14. Remember, faith does not stand alone and cannot stand alone. Yes, what faith transforms the believer into the likeness of Christ. And for that to happen, you have to add these things, the word of all commands, for you to begin to grow in grace. Remember again, development of these divine traits by the believer is mandatory. I hope you are, it is a command. It's not a suggestion. The divine nature must be reflected in the life of the believer. Transformation of the life of the believer is mandatory in keeping with divine nature. This is because of who they now belong to after being saved. I hope you get that. The person you now belong to, so you have been saved. That's why it's mandatory for you to be transformed. And so it's important for us to, again, remember or remind ourselves the objects of the Christian faith and the faith of the believer. You can pause this video and think and reflect. Yes. Who or who are the objects of your faith? On who are you focused? So it's important for us to understand this. The Christian faith has its objects as and as is directed towards the Father. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Scripture, which is the Word of God, and the body of Christ. That is the genuine believers. People who have genuinely been born again. Yes. These are the objects of the faith of the believer. What do you notice among all those? You will notice that all of them are divine and holy beyond our comprehension. But we belong to them if we are genuinely born again. So we are told that believers have been given the power to partake of their divine nature. The word of God says God is holy and his people must be holy. 
Hence, believers must be transformed into the likeness of Christ. And that is where the work comes in. Giving all diligence or making every effort, believers then begin to act to their faith. In other words, the Christian faith is the beginning of the journey to final glorification in heaven. So, believers are to live as Christ lived. Believers are not just to confess their faith in Christ, but are in addition to live as he taught and commanded his disciples. In fact, it says that, you know, in Matthew 7, 24 to 27, the Lord Jesus gave the illustration of two men, Mr. Rocky and Mr. Sandy. They had his word, his sayings. The one who, who did what Christ wanted was the one considered wise who built his house upon the rock. And when the, the, the challenges of life came, when the weather came, the house was able to withstand the onslaught and to stand. The one who built on site is the one who had what did not put those things into action. And so when the challenges came, when the weather came, the house fell and great was its fall. So it is true that works are not prerequisite for the salvation of the believer. But faith must be visible in the lives of true believers in their transformed lives. This is what we've been spoken here. We're not being told that you need to do these things to be saved, but you are being told this has to happen because you have been saved. Believers must evidence a thriving spiritual growth. Observe that the first five virtues related to the inner life of believers. In other words, transformation from within. There must be, remember, the, 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 the believer is a new creature in Christ. That new creature is regenerate completely new. And then, this person now has begun to partake of divine nature, and this begins to show forth outside, externally. Yes. And so, it's important for us. The last two has to do with the relationship of believers with others. And so as the believer is renewed within, the relationship, external relationship begins to also be transformed. Believers have these seven traits listed here and continue to increase in them. Yes, continue to increase them will lead to being productive, fruitful, and effective in their spiritual life. So these are not listed in any other sequence as if progressing from one to the next. We see that faith is the beginning and entrance into the Christian life of faith and love is the climax. I encourage you to reflect on Romans chapter 5 verses 1 to 5 and 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 13. These are the responsibilities of believers in Christ, which result from their receiving the resources of God as enumerated in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Such believers will thus progress more and more towards Christ's likeness. Again, this is another way of urging the believers to make progress towards spiritual maturity. Believers are to undergo a lifelong process of spiritual growth. These character traits are not a call to legalism. Uh, don't begin to say, oh, you are not supposed to follow rules or whatever. Rather, these are the desires and the evidence of a transformed life. They reflect other lists of virtue expected of the true believer in Christ. I encourage you again 
Read and reflect on Galatians 5, 22-23, Hebrews 12, 10-11, and James 3, verses 17-18. The believers in Christ will increase in these virtues as evidence of their faith, continuing obedience, and ongoing progress towards Christ-likeness. Remember this, true faith desires to be clothed in righteousness. Therefore, it engages in action which will lead to its possessor, who have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, developing the righteousness of the Lord. Colossians 3 and and so the question arises, do you have the Christian faith? The faith of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Remember that this faith results in action. For it trusts, obeys, surrenders, and commits to its objects. And we repeat those objects again. God the Father the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and the Church of Christ. So, are you? That's a big question. Are you of that faith? Remember, in all this, believers must avoid two dangers. Faith is the essential or crucial beginning the foundation, so to say, other things must therefore, must therefore be added. Room must be made for such things as to be added. The believer must remove sin from his heart. Get rid of the old before he can bring in the new. So the two dangers are to be avoided. That is, an unclean life that is useless to God. That's one and an empty life devoid of any good works and fruit. God wants to fill us with good things, but we must first empty ourselves of the bad. Or remember that faith includes obedience. Yes, we are justified by faith. The faith that saves us is faith in Christ, the faith of the heart. Romans 10, 9. It is the faith which brings the whole life into obedience to Christ. So do you have the faith of the heart? Have you made a clean break with sin? Consider this. And please reflect seriously on this question. What purpose is there in Christ dying to save you from sin if you continue in sin? If you continue in sin and continue to rationalize, you continue to confornicate, you continue to engage in occultism, you continue to follow cults, you continue to do all sorts of things that are ungodly, problem practices, and then Instead of repenting, you continue to rationalize. So the question to you is this. What is there? What purpose is there in Christ dying to save you from sin? If you continue in sin. If you continue in what Christ says he has saved you from. What the word of God says has no dominion over you anymore. Or you are still letting yourself to be controlled by sin, by your lust, by appetites, by your appetite. What's the purpose? Part of the preparation of the heart is the divine nature. You know, is the divine additions listed here. You must give wholehearted effort or all diligence to add to your faith. Remember again, you must grow spiritually. 
and progress to Christ likeness. Must grow spiritually and thus be fruitful and be productive and progress to Christ likeness. You, the believer, must progress through the work of the Holy Spirit in progressive sanctification. Again, remember, believers are urged for growing grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him, be both, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Second Peter 3. This is what every true believer in Christ should do. Again, remember, to your faith, add moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, patient endurance or perseverance. Godliness, brotherly kindness, love. Though after you have spent a lifetime walking in faith and God walking in you, you will still be far short, Christ will make up any lack on your part. Yes. But determine today. That you will grow spiritually to become more Christ like and more useful, a more useful vessel in the hand of God as you add moral, yes, as you do this, you add moral excellence, <clears throat> you add to your faith moral excellence. One can repeat this enough, frequently enough, moral excellence, knowledge, self control. Patient endurance, godliness, brotherly love, brotherly kindness, and love. Remember, you have been given all you need to succeed in this holy endeavor. And therefore, because he has given all the need to succeed, God mandates abundance of these traits. Even. So, I encourage you, begin to obey this mandate of the Lord from now. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our Father, thank you that you have revealed your wonderful love to us, your only begotten Son. Jesus Christ, and offered us forgiveness and salvation. Grant us the grace that we may not make light of it and may not neglect so great a salvation. That we may not resist your spirit and your word. Rather, that submitting to your Holy Spirit we may turn from our waywardness and return to you at your reproof. O oh Lord, establish, strengthen, and settle us that with full purpose of heart we may cleave to you. May that incorruptible seed by which you regenerate us into a living hope of eternal life so drive its roots into our hearts and bring forth fruit that your name may be glorified. And may we be so planted by the river of the water of life that we may grow and flourish. And that the fruit of righteousness may appear through the whole course of our lives until we shall at length enjoy that blessed life which is laid up for us in heaven. In Jesus' name. Please understand all that have been said pertains to believers in Christ. They are the only ones addressed thus far here. But God is aware of you. If you are not yet 
a believer in Christ, you are not yet a member of the household of God. You can become adopted to the family of God. But then you have to agree with the verdict of God. He assessed everybody without exception. And his verdict is that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.26 23. And by the same assessment, his judgment is that the wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. Of course, nobody can save themselves. You cannot save yourself. It doesn't matter what resources you think you may have or how good you think you are. You just cannot save yourself. And God, who is aware of this, has made provision. Even in your sinful state, God continues to show and to demonstrate his love. Let's hear his words speak to us now. Romans, I mean, uh, uh, his word says, God, But God commended his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5 8. He goes further, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. Remember this again. God so loved the world, that is the people in the world. He gave his only begotten son. Whoever believe, the opposite is also true. Those who do not believe, will not, we perish and they will not have everlasting life. But those who believe, will not perish and they will have everlasting life. It is further explained. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Perhaps you are wondering, okay, if I want to be born again, if I want to be adopted, what do I do? Explain now in simple language. If you will confess that Jesus, with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you believe with your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's explained further. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So you believe with your heart, then you confess with your mouth. Romans 10, 9 to 10. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the promise of God. And that's an open invitation to everybody. Romans 10, 13. So you have no excuse. You have heard now. It doesn't matter where you are, what is your station in life. You've heard the invitation saying to you, it is whoever. So don't restrict, restrict yourself and don't let anybody restrict you. Don't let anybody determine your fate before you have come to the Lord himself. The Lord Jesus, remember, is the one calling you. Not my word. And if you are still doubting, hear him now. And as you hear, please, I, I implore you. Heed the Lord's call. Yes, I'm appealing to you. By the mercies of God. Hear and obey now. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty-eight to 30 Please, heed the Lord's call now. Act on what you have heard. Yes. Remember this, a Christless life is a crisis-filled, hell-heading life on a breakless or fast moving vehicle. Again, I appeal to you, please, you need to get out of that vehicle now, before it is too late, and it crashes headlong into hell. I pray that the Lord accept you to his kingdom. 
as you appropriate the finished sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.